was for being efficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I guess we should start going uh, with the meeting. Um, so uh, do we have a, a motion to approve the agenda? Yep. I just want to make a little, go ahead. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, if, if we could, um, Will, I was hoping to move item 6.1 into my staff updates, which is 5.1, just because it flows better that way. Sounds like a cunning plan. All right. So um, any more uh, comments or changes? Okay, so can I get a motion for uh, approval of the agenda? Motion to approve. Okay, and uh, seconder? Thank you, Bonnie. All in favor? Excellent. And approval of the minutes, motion. Thank you, Rebecca, seconder. McKaylee, thank you, and all in favor? Just uh, before we approve, um, just one correction. The, the spelling stuff of the Art Renison Nature Park needs to be corrected. Okay. R E W -N, N. And is it Nature Park, Bonnie, or Nature Preserve? Yes, Nature Park is the designation within the parks plan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Okay, so um, public comments. I don't see any public to comment. So shall we continue on? Council referrals, um, the uh, proposed site alteration bylaw with Daniel. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Um, so I have a council referral, as you've mentioned, and I'll just start a presentation here. All right, how does that look? Good. Good. All right. So I guess by way of, it's not in this presentation, but just by way of update for council. When I last came, I believe, to this committee, or at least at an earlier presentation I gave on a proposed hazardous areas development permit area, and you gave some very insightful comments that were they were well received. Ultimately, council decided not to proceed with that bylaw and that development permit area and instead directed staff to proceed with a site alteration bylaw. Um, so that's where you are. So it's not that that both these bylaws are still advancing, but that council, based on you know feedback received, decided not to proceed with that um, development permit bylaw and instead with this site alteration bylaw, just for um, overall okay. background. Uh, there we go. Okay, so site alteration bylaws. So this is just some general information if, if committee members are, are not familiar, but as, so a site alteration bylaw is to regulate site alteration activities, such as altering the grade of placing of dumping or fill, removal of topsoil creation or the creation of exposed soils. Um, and this just for those interested, this comes from power in the community charter that governs local governments. Um, so empowers municipalities specifically to establish bylaws to regulate, prohibit, impose requirements for the removal of soil and the deposit of soil or other materials. So, and then site alteration may be any activity that disturbs soil or vegetation. Um, and then just why, why is council interested in developing a site alteration bylaw? So um, specifically worried about land alterations can result in changes to runoff patterns to water resources, land stability and ecological integrity. And we currently don't regulate all of these activities we do if you're in a um, in some of our water resource protection area development permits um, but in terms of general on a lot on Bowen Island we don't regulate um, site alteration activities so the bylaw would provide protection for landowners neighbors of proposed developments and environment by having um, evaluation and mitigation measures in place prior to site alterations occurring so just by way of background um, our OCP adopted in 20 which was 2010 adopted in 2011, has some policies to talk about, specifically policy 218 is talking about removal or deposit of soil from a parcel may be subject to a regulation by bylaw. So envisioned at that time and, and council's now brought it forward. Um, and then I know my background report has more objectives, but just, this is an example of one in terms of an objective to maintain stability and quality of soils 
as seen as important on, on the island. Um, and then in our island plans, this is the 2021 version, but has been in for a little while, is contemplating continuing work on a site alteration bylaw. So in 2021, we envisioned at the bottom of the screen there, implementing funding a work plan, engaging the public, presenting the draft bylaw and recommendations to council. So I think I presented the draft bylaw to council in April. So we're a little behind the 2021 plan, but, but that's um, where this project has come from. And so, yeah, as I said, April 25th, um, staff presented a draft bylaw to council and council directed staff to refer it to a public open house and to this committee where we are today. Um, so in general, the proposed bylaw would, would establish different levels of permits required for site alteration with escalating permit fees and application requirements based on the extent of the site alteration that is proposed. Site alteration in the bylaw would mean the placing dumping deposit of soil or other materials, the alteration of the grade of the land, or the compaction of soil or the creation of impervious surfaces. Um, sorry, I'm speeding through this. So do, do tell me if you want me to slow down on a, on a slide or I'm happy to go back at the end as well. Um, and then so exposed soil, meaning areas of a lot where the vegetation has been removed, causing an increased risk of erosion and, and sediment. Um, and then I, I go through each of these in, in more detail, but in general, what the bylaw would do is establish uh, a regulatory scheme where, um, as you see increased site alteration, um, either in volume of soil or area of exposed soil, um, you would have increased permit fees, increased deposits, increased application requirements. So essentially establishes these different levels of permitting that would be required. So activities that are exempt with basic permits, small, medium, or large type of activities. Um, and so this is what's proposed in the bylaw and what we, we really hope to get feedback on both from this committee and through the public process is trying to determine what's the appropriate, what are appropriate thresholds? Is this the right um, mechanism? Are, are these correct? Are there things that, you know, do people think that these, these thresholds are too large or too small? Um, I think I've heard both from different people. So sort of a, still an open question, what, what, what is the right level of, of regulation and, and permitting requirements? Um, so first, the bylaw has things that are exempt, so that don't require a permit. So in this case, it talks about removal of less than 10 cubic meters of soil in a calendar year, um, or of less than 20 cubic meters on a land on land without essentially a flat um, land, so a slope of less than 20%. So 10 square meters if you're on a sloped area, and 20 square meters, sorry, 20 cubic meters if you're on a sloped site, or the creation of less than 50 square meters of exposed soil in a calendar year. Um, so just in terms of context for people, 50 square meters is about this sort of smaller portion of, of a tennis court, the sort of box that um, is outside the service area. Um, the permit, the bylaw would also exempt other just straight up activities from permitting requirements. So constructing highway or trail, um, work done as a permitted farm use, work done related to an issued building permit. So that would relate to the building activity itself and not um, like associated land developments. That would mean, you know, just the act of getting a building permit wouldn't require a site alteration bylaw. Um, sort of the assumption being that the building permit itself has regulations required in it, um, but you would require one for other activity like the, the driveway, for example, or, you know, creating land around it. Um, and then work to resolve an emergency situation would be exempt as well. Um, just some background, I know sometimes it's hard to picture. But so some of the information we put out is how large is a cubic meter of soil? So when you see the sort of landscape bags of soil, they're approximately a, a cubic meter. They're a, a box of a bag of soil. It's a meter on each side. Um, and then a standard dump truck holds approximately 10 cubic meters of soil. It depends on weight, um, but that's a sort of a rough guideline of, of how big activities are that are exempt. Um, then there'd be a basic permit with a $50 fee that would be for 50 cubic meters of soil in a calendar year or 100 square meters of exposed soil. So that's about half of a tennis court is that 100 square meters. Um, and this would be sort of basic information. So the title information, who owns the property, description of the work and ability of staff to ask for more information if required, if we sort of note anything that would need, need additional information. Otherwise it'd be a sort of a fairly simple permit. Um, then we'd, we'd ramp up, we'd say a, a small permit would have a $250 fee and that's between 50 and 100 cubic meters of soil or between 100 and 250 square meters of exposed soil. 
So here I've measured out the, the cycle track at Bix is about the 250 square meters. So in terms of exposing soil. Um, and this would look for a site plan, location of the soil deposited or removed if that's happening, um, and a plan from a registered professional. And sort of the details of that are in the, the bylaw itself, but, but looking for some, some professional oversight on the activity. Um, medium then goes up, so between 100 and 1,000 cubic meters of soil or 250 to 1,000 square meters of exposed soil. Um, so here I've shown that the whole tennis court and the area around it, the whole fenced area is about 650 square meters. Um, so as before, but it include plans for erosion and drainage control, both um, during work and after completion and proposed grading and rehabilitation plan for the site. So one thing that we see in construction projects is often um, we'll see plans for what's called the civil work. So the civil engineering work, which will include drainage plans um, for the site after construction has taken place. So they say, you know, we're going to build it. And when we're done, we're going to have a swale and a drainage pattern, and it's going to you know, be established so that runoff isn't, isn't occurring. Um, but sometimes it then the, the phasing of that and how it comes in isn't necessarily captured. So we see that, you know, they say when, when it's all done, there'll be this drainage pond, but till we build it, there's sometimes a lack between when the site is cleared and then when the erosion control gets put in. Sometimes there's not a plan for how that happens during construction. So that's something we would want to see um, at this medium level of permit. And then finally, large is more than a thousand cubic meters of soil or the creation of more than a thousand square meters of exposed soil. Um, so in this case, the turf field is, is 1,500 square meters. So, so it would be a large, uh, large permit or the community center, um, 1,900 cubic meters of material are removed. Um, and the permit requirements would essentially be the same as for the medium permit in terms of what we're asking for. But I would imagine then the, the actual plans themselves would be more involved um, given the scale of work involved. Um, we have a website now for the information on the um, proposed bylaw. So it's our website slash site alteration for more information. We also have open houses coming up next week with the public. So there's a virtual open house um, next Wednesday and then an in-person on the Thursday. Um, so the recommendation on the agenda is, is to the ECAC provide comments on the proposed site alteration bylaw. Um, and I'll stop here just for to take questions. Okay, thank you, Daniel. So um, I, I've actually um, uh, found that I can now on my iPad see everybody on on screen. So uh, <laughs> I can uh, I can I, I won't be uh, uh, deferring to to Jeff to to, to identify people who want to make uh, comments. Um, so. Any questions for uh, comments from uh, committee? Hi, McKaylee. Never shy to hop in. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one of them is about the um, adding of soil. For instance, if you have a property that decides they want to put in a raised garden bed and they're bringing soil to the site, they're not actually exposing soil. They're just putting it on top of the existing ground. Um, I, um, I wanted to see if it would apply to that situation. And then also if the existing condition of the site comes into play. Um, um, so if you have a, an area that's already landscaped and then you have somebody that's putting in a new garden and, and taking off the grass that's there, it's essentially going from a landscape surface to garden beds, something along those lines, they're exposing the soil. Uh, but I, I just wanted to see if, if uh, that had been thought, thought through. I think definitely the first one, um, as the bylaw currently is, it, yes, it would apply. So you're depositing soil. Um, if it's above the, like the scale, then, then that would be required. One of the things that I've thought of since, um, since presenting this to council and so would be bringing back to council and, and can hear committee input too. It's just in terms of, you know, exempt activities, like currently the bylaw for the most part just does it based on scale. And then it has some of those exempt activities I mentioned, but an option could be to, to include just a cat more categories of activities that are exempt. So for, for example, the obvious example being like building a vegetable, like a residential garden, right? Like maybe that's exempt activity. Um, or is it, you know, we'll know we'd be worried about it at some scale. 
you know, but it's something, an option that like, if there's activities that it's like, well, we don't mean to regulate those type of things. We're trying to regulate, you know, large scale clearing, large scale altering versus somebody building asparagus beds. Maybe that's not, you know, activity we want to get involved in and we should just exempt it um, is definitely an option. Um, Rebecca. Um, I have a, a question about the thresholds. You mentioned that that's one of the things that you'll be asking through the consultation process is whether or not the thresholds are appropriate. Um, and I was wondering about other municipalities that have similar bylaws and more experience with those bylaws and um, what can be learned from that as far as appropriate thresholds, or maybe that's how you arrived at your starting point. It is largely how I arrived. Um, so I think in earlier versions of this report coming to council, we had done some tables, which yeah, I didn't include here, but tables looking at other municipalities and saying like what's common. Mm -hmm. And it is common, it's sort of in the like 10 to 30 cubic meters of like, you know, that's roughly the level people seem to say, okay, below that is fine. Um, yeah. Thanks. I don't know. I guess the, the one part I'm not sure. I mean, I'm thinking most specifically the ones I used most often, I think were Squamish and Pemberton and Seashelt. So maybe they are appropriate. Cause I think about, you know, if you're in a, if you're in an urban setting, like obviously those thresholds mean different things than if you're in sort of like large lot rural setting, it's like a different environment in terms of how much activity would you see take place before you want a permit. I saw Jeff's hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, a little bit of what um, I wanted to follow along is what McKaylee raised and that, you know, there's no, the way it's written right now, there's no, you know, it's, um, there's no ag activity based criteria or exemptions. And my first thought was around gardens as well, too, actually. And, and, and then I was thinking about, well, what is it that we're, that this bylaw is, it, is intended to achieve? And, and I'm wondering if it's spelled up, spelled out enough in both the bylaw and the materials that have been prepared is what are we trying to get out of this? And what the benefits that we might see from this bylaw, and then we can be using that better to identify then what the risks are. And maybe that might help us get to what activities are um, have the greatest potential to result in um, soil loss or erosion, sedimentation, and things like that. So, it's a comment I guess I have is that I, I'm 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 I think it, I'm I'm wondering if it's clear enough about what we're trying to get out of this bylaw beyond yes, the municipality has the ability to regulate this. And I think Jeff, like where I see it clearest need is it like essentially the large scale and thinking like okay somebody's going to subdivide and create 10 lots and it's like right we're going to say okay you need a plan for it. it needs to be shown right you're doing like large scale land development and you're putting in roads and building sites and doing large scale clearing you know that that's pretty like ha has potential to be done badly I'm not saying anything about you know current development but it's just like that has potential for for negative effects um, with the idea being that as part of that process, you would get a permit, it would be regulated, we would ensure it happens. And at the end of the day, you'd end up with, you know, however many it is, 10 single family lots. And the idea being, if you establish the bylaw appropriately, people buying those lots then can like build their house on the site. They don't need to get a permit. It's been dealt with and sort of managed. And as long as they're sort of proceeding with what, what they're purchasing, that they are, they then don't need the permit. Um, and it's been dealt with at that like you know subdivision stage. Um, I know I do I do struggle in terms of like individual people then doing you know landscaping on their site. It's like, yeah, how much of that do we want to regulate versus then we have seen examples where people do things like, well, that they clear all the trees and all the vegetation, they leave it exposed and it runs off. Or people who um, you know do large excavation, they don't get a retaining wall because they know that needs a building permit. So they'd rather just like excavate and change their grade. And now they've left like an exposed soil slope of their neighbors that's going to erode. And 
we'll try to say to them, it's like, well, that's not good. You should do something about it. And they're like, well, there's no rule. You know, I can do what I want. Um, so, so some of those activities we see as potentially, you know, dangerous, causing erosion, causing um, soil runoff. Yeah. So just to follow up on, on that, Daniel, um, I, I, I was going to say that I really like that you used um, the um, Objective 22 from the OCP, um, but I was, I was thinking that it was more inclusive that, that the, the, the focus would be more inclusive for um, like habitat protection, um, um, uh, waterways protection and, and that kind of thing. So um, that I was wondering, is there any intention in this bylaw for those parts of it? Uh, you know, the, the, and it, it leads me to, to this thing about the, uh, the, the area is, is that the only criteria that, that should be considered? Because I'm thinking that um, 50 square meters of, um, of um, second growth uh, forest is not equivalent uh, environmentally to the same area of wetland. So, you know, people that have a little wetland on, on their property, uh, um, uh, converting it into something else by filling it in or uh, digging it out and making it a pond and, and all that kind of thing. Um, and the, the other thing about that, um, that area alone, I'm wondering about the, the, the slope in, in, uh, involved too. So again, um, uh, any of those areas on a really steep slope, I know you've, you've covered it partly with that uh, 20% uh, grade, at least in one criteria, but um, I'm just wondering if, if area of exposed soil is um, the only criteria that, that should be considered, but that makes it a lot more complex, so. Mm -hmm. No, but that's a good, good comment. Um, and then regarding sort of, you know, environmentally sensitive areas, it's like the, this bylaw, yeah, is not an environmentally sensitive area development permit area, for example, but it's yeah. it's specific to regulating just soil disturbance, site alteration yeah. disturbance. Yeah. The, the other thing that I was thinking that, that could just maybe strengthen this is, is a little more um, uh, emphasis on neighbors. You know, that they, the idea that uh, the, mm. the, the change of, of slope can uh, um, great or, and water flow can greatly impact their, your neighbors. So, um, uh, and, and I think that's, you know, I've seen things like that in other communities and this community come up where those, those, those are major issues. So yeah. just uh, in, in the framing, it might just be uh, nice to add a little bit more on, on that. Thanks. Any more comments from, from people? David. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, Will. And I think the direction we're going is interesting. It, it's useful. I think, so I'm just sort of flipping back into the bylaw itself. Like the tricky, the difficult part about this perhaps is that we're using those numbers like cubic meters and square meters, which are pretty rough. Uh, like for one thing, you have to have a little diagram of a tennis court. So we even know what that is and, you know, a dump truck and, and, and so on. I think sort of where, where everybody's been going, a description, I'm going back to the beginning of the bylaw, we've got a couple of whereases, but there's no real description of the purpose, at least I couldn't see it. And if we had a little more, bit more explanation of what we're trying to avoid, and as Jeff said, what we're trying to gain, I think that could help so that we're not just relying on, okay, it's 11 square meter, or whatever, uh, and now it falls into this category. Um, I think we need to understand what we're trying to gain, what we're trying to avoid a little bit more at the top end of the bylaw. That might, might just might help clarify, to, clarify it a whole lot. So um, I don't have any huge suggestions, but I just, I, I kind of like the way the discussion is going. Thanks, David. David. I, yeah, I, 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 go, so, go ahead, Dave. Um, Daniel, sorry. Sure. I, yeah, I was just gonna say it's tricky, sort of crafting a bylaw that's trying to say, like, well, we, you know, we want to regulate people doing bad things, um, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Um, I see that uh, Maureen and uh, McKaylee have their hands up. I don't know who came uh, first, but uh, I'll, I'll pick Maureen because she's on the top of my squares. That sounds very cute to be on the top of your square. Um, <laughs> my question, and I, forgive me, Daniel, if this has been addressed elsewhere. Uh, let's say we have the bylaw in place and somebody is working with a, an area equivalent to the, the turf field and they've paid their deposit and they got their permit and something goes really wrong. Um, you know, there's a lot of runoff. They're, they run into all sorts of things. So my question is, how do you proceed with the deposit in those circumstances? Is the deposit against damages to the land, against staff time? What, what does the deposit do? It would be about damages rather than staff time. So it would be similar to like we hold the deposit for building permits and specifically it's for um, like rectifying a dangerous situation um, or rectifying damage to, you know, municipal property in case of building permit. So it's like somebody leaves a hole in the ground, you know, and stops building at some point we could go and say, okay, we're going to use your deposit to make this safe. So it's not a hazard. Um, so I'd imagine the deposit for this would be similar, It'd be okay. You know, you've caused erosion, you've caused runoff, we're going to use the deposit to like do remediation around your property, I would imagine. Um, and then what's not before you, but but what we will bring, like if council proceeds with the bylaw is, is again, an amendment to our bylaw notice um, bylaw, which would have a finding schedule. So you would then, you know, if somebody's not, if they get a permit with conditions and they're not following it, we would be fining. Okay. Um, yeah. So the damage is specifically for one, it's sort of to encourage people to do it, but more technically it's like, it's for us to remediate. And then the fining mechanism would be damn it, like to, to punish essentially somebody for not following conditions. Okay. And the determination of what constitutes remediation, that would be municipal staff, or it would be a, a professional brought in to assess. Hmm. Are we there yet? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 clear. You know, it's probably municipal staff starting it, saying like you, you've caused damage, and then, but probably ultimately then working with professionals. I guess it depends on the the scale of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just thinking in terms of a bylaw. It's uh, th there's a phrase in there something like as determined by municipal staff and or a licensed whatever yeah. environmental professional. Okay, thank you. Can I just chime in too, there's, um, I'm certified in erosion sedimentation control, um, as are some other staff, and I'm hoping in perpetuity we would have staff, just because we deal with those issues a lot on Bowen, so, but I like the caveat or that both, can, yeah, staff and or professional. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bonnie. And McKaylee, you've been waiting patiently. I um, wanted to find out um, in the situation where a retaining wall is put in and it's backfilled and the backfill has the potential to straddle property lines, who then obtains the permit and how um, will, will it be required to have two permits for both properties? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know if it's covered specifically. I know our, like our development approvals procedure bylaw talks about if if things are adjacent parcels it can be one permit um so i think maybe then i would have to amend that bylaw to include this like this bylaw as a named bylaw but then it would be if it's like one project that straddles multiple properties it would be one permit okay and then i also wanted to find out how this bylaw interplays with the watershed aquifer and stream protection bylaw um, if there's a proposed project in the WASP bylaw, does that then trump this and they're only getting the one permit? People would be getting two. They would need a development permit and this permit if required. Okay, is that it, McKaylee? 
Thank you. And Jeff, I see you've got your hand up. Yep, back to round two. Uh, I got a couple of comments or questions. One, uh, the first is on the definition of soil. I see that it, um, you know, talks about clay, silt, topsoil, fill, sand, gravel, etc., including the bedrock. Now, I'm just wondering how alteration to a site without superficial sediments, soils, etc., relates if somebody wants to remove some bedrock either by hand or, or mechanically or by explosives. Like, oh, where, where does bedrock removal come in on this? I think if you're removing bedrock, when like, you know, you may or may not have removed soil on top of it too, but, <clears throat> um, but I think then you're, you're altering like the drain or potentially altering the drainage pattern on the site. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so you can imagine you've taken off the ridge and you've taken it out and now the water's flowing differently over the site and, and how it's impacting downstream stuff could all be different because of, because of that removal. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking about if, you know, a property with just like a rock knob sitting, you know, poking out, whether on a coastal mm -hmm. bluff or inland or something like that, um, that are free of soils by the conventional definition. And um, you could argue that there would no be no alteration of drainage if it's a hunk of rock poking out. Um, you know, would someone be allowed to either blast or, or remove that rock without this permit. Yeah, I mean, by this bylaw, that would be, that would be covered, like that would be covered in terms of would need a permit. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, the, the second one is, when I was looking at the definitions, there's one for wood waste, but I, I don't see wood waste mentioned again mm -hmm. in the rest of the bylaw. And I'm just wondering, what the, does that play into it in some way? Hmm. No, that probably we should remove that. That's probably left from an earlier drafted version. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's good for me. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. And I see Bonnie's got her hand up. I just want to thank everybody for their comments. This is this is great, great group and lots of expertise on the committee. Um, I just wanted from a staff perspective um, that this, yeah, the intent of the bylaw, as was noted earlier, is not for ecological protection. You know, maybe in the future we'll develop some more protections in that area. But from a staff perspective, I do see positive um, spin-offs for ecological protection from the bylaw. So um, indirect um, protections, um, yeah. And just because over the years, you know, I have responded to complaints from neighbors where clearing has um, occurred, you know, adjacent to property lines, blasting has occurred, um, uh, creeks have been diverted, you know, like just all sorts of responses and more and more, I think, as we develop as an island and properties become closer that, you know, everything is connected. And um, so, yeah, so I, I think it's a, a positive step. You know, there's there's things to iron out still and pieces to figure out. But from an ecological standpoint, I think there'll be positive spinoffs. I second that, Bonnie. Daniel, I've got a, a question. Uh, uh, after, uh, I'll, I'll speak before Marina. She's, uh, um, and I've looked at some other bylaws and, and they also have a, uh, like in, in your table that on page two of, of, of the, the handout that, uh, you, you, that we, we got, um, there's the, a nice table of, of different, the different classifications and, and that. And, in other jurisdictions, they would have another column, which would be fines for not um, uh, going through the bylaw process. And I'm just wondering if that's something that uh, is covered elsewhere, or if, if that's something that, uh, that could be um, in this bylaw. Yeah, I mean, in essence, what we would do is we would bring another bylaw to amend our, it's called our bylaw notice enforcement bylaw. 
Um, and it specifies like the signing schedule in essence. Um, and it's something that staff intend to bring. Um, I just didn't do it as part of this initial round, but wanted yep. to hear sort of feedback and council's you know, direction to proceed, but we would be then doing it where it would go through and it would say, okay, you know, section whatever of the bylaws says you have to do this. And there's a fine, there's like a first offense fine and a second offense fine or we're just, I think we're moving away from that language, but it just be like an offense and it can be up to $500 is the amount that we're allowed to have a, have an offense um, per, a, per offense. And then typically in the bylaw says each offense is a, or each day can be a new offense. <clears throat> so in theory of, you know, somebody's doing it and they haven't put in the erosion control that they're required to do, you know, file officers could visit the site and could ticket and say we're coming back, you know, in theory, they could come back the next day. And if it's not in place, they could take it again and they could continue to do that. Um, you know, typically we'll have a, a system where people are warned and then fined and then told we're gonna come back at this point and do it again. But yeah, but there will there will be a fining mechanism. Yeah. If this okay. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Maureen. Thanks, Will. Um, this may be totally off, off base, Daniel, but um it, it comes from a, a experience, not, not a bad experience, everything went well. Um, would this bylaw affect drilled wells? Sorry, that's not a clearly stated question, but what, would it? I, I don't think so. Like, I think your area unless they needed to dig, like clear an area to, to operate or to access the, the drilling site. Um, I don't think you're removing that much soil as part of drilling a well. Okay. Right, like I think you'd pretty safely be less than, you know, 20 square, 20 cubic meters of soil removed. I can't, yeah, so I can't imagine that it would trigger. Yeah, the, the reason I'm asking is we, at a different location, had, had a neighbor who put in place a, a drilled well and it all, all went very smoothly, but it was, there was some clearing. It was immediately adjacent to, to our property and there didn't appear to be any, any kinds of um, permits involved at the local level. Is, is that correct? That there are no local level permits when there's a drilled well involved. Yeah, correct. Okay, thank you. It, just to follow that up, Daniel, um, what if it involved um, clearing land to access the site to drill the well? Then it would. Like if you're exposing soil, you're removing all the vegetation or something to get access to your well site you know, then that activity would be regulated. Yeah. <clears throat> I see mckaylee has got her hand up. Yeah, technical soil pits, same same situation. I mean, there are properties where I've gone out and they've had like four or five test pits excavated. You could question whether or not it met, met the minimum requirement, but then they've also removed vegetation in order to get their, their equipment there. Yeah, so again, I think that the test pits would be lower than that area-wise, um, but maybe it's something that actually should be specifically exempted. It's just the test pits. Because again, it's like you don't want to end up in a catch-22 situation if we tell people you need a geological report as part of this permit. And they're like, we need to go dig holes. And I'm like, well, not until you get a permit. Um, seems a little silly. So I think in general, it's like the digging would probably be below the threshold. If they had to do large scale clearing as a result, you know, to get there, then that might trigger the permit. Yeah. I've got I've got a silly question, Daniel. It it's to do with the the, the term uh, cleared soil, and it's I'm just wondering, is there a time limit on on how long the, the soil remains? Clear. I'm, I'm just thinking, is there a workaround of this, of clear cutting a, uh, a, a chunk of property and then immediately uh, seeding it with grass seed? Mm. And then you, you, they, you could complain, you could say, well, it's not, it's not exposed soil, it's, um, it's, it's planted soil. 
I mean, I think as it is now, it's sort of like, we would say, well, it's not exposed soil if you say cut, you know, the majority of the trees, but you left the trees, you didn't dig up the stumps, um, you know, yeah. so like you've, you've removed some of the vegetation, but all the, not all the vegetation. It's probably, that's not exposed soil. So then there's probably like a temporal aspect, right? You remove some, most of the vegetation and you plant new vegetation and then you remove the other half of the vegetation or plate, you know? Yeah. yeah, there's probably a way people could could work to, that they're not doing it, but it, to some extent we say, well, then that that's great. They haven't created the exposed soil and the the risk of erosion. So in that what sense, that, that, that that's fine. They've met the criteria. Because um, yeah, because this bylaw like specifically is not a, a you know a tree a tree bylaw like some municipalities they'll end up with both it's a soil a site alteration and tree removal bylaw and they combine them in one and it's very clear that it's regulating tree cutting um and this bylaw does not it's just about exposing soil uh, rebecca very well i am mindful of the time but uh i just have a question about the length of time to obtain a permit so assuming that the application is fairly straightforward and the applicant has supplied you with all of the information that you require, how long would a, a permit like this typically take? I would imagine the basic permit would work similar to currently we have a, um, it's an excavation permit associated with a building permit. So if you to essentially start the excavation, we typically are turning those around in like two to three weeks. So that would be the basic where it's like, it's a smaller area. There's not much information we need to verify. Okay, you know, you own the site. There's no existing issues. Um, and then the, the larger permits are probably closer to our development permit time, which is like two to three months. Thanks. Any more questions for Daniel? Comments? Oh, David. Sure, I'm, I'm just going back to um, the, the earlier comments and, and suggested changes to the bylaw. I mean, I'm, I'm going back to the bylaw right now and, get, and looking at, okay, why are we doing this? What are we trying to gain? So that, all that is in the whereas is right at the top. And so I'm just going to read, you know, the first one, the first whereas it, it says, you know, we've got the right to do stuff as a municipality. The second whereas says what we're trying to achieve here. So. Uh, in keeping with good, so sorry, site alteration, blah, 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 in keeping with good practice and so as to minimize nuisance, safety concerns, and the spread of invasive species. So I think we, if we added a couple of other minimizes, if we were acting to minimize erosion, minimize drainage alterations, and minimize habitat loss, I think that kind of covers the things we're talking about. And, and it makes someone realize if they're just going to take a get a whole couple of truckloads of soil and put it on their lawn and turn it into a vegetable garden, that's not gonna do any of those, not gonna cause any drainage problems, any erosion, any habitat loss. So it's sort of automatically, we don't need to worry about how many square meters it is or how many truckloads. It's, it's, it's not one of the problems we're talking about. So I, I don't know, that's my idea is just slapping a few things like that into, into the second whereas, which tells us what on earth we're trying to, trying to achieve here. All right. I've got a list going, Will. Good. Um, the other thing that uh, that I would like to to add is looking at the alternatives that that uh, that staff have. There, we're given two uh, alternatives that you're looking at. I strongly support the alternative one uh, that uh, um, the. Uh, that staff continue to work on this uh, this bylaw uh, and 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 uh, move it forward. So uh, I think from what I'm hearing, uh, the support that that people are giving uh, uh, in this uh, in in this conversation, I think that's what I'm, I'm. I think most of us are thinking. All right, so I think we're uh, we're done with with questions for Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Do you want me to share a screen and you can vote on the comments? 
Yes, please. Um, it's pretty scrappy language. I can edit offline. Yep. Um, thank you. Can you see? Yep. So the first bullet is trying to capture Jeff and um, Councillor Hawking's um, comments about adding intentions. Maybe I can wordsmith that after. The next one is yep. about exempted activities, categories of exempted activities. Daniel, mm -hmm. is that pro properly? Yeah. And then um, it seemed like, the, oh yeah, then um, Councillor Hawking was talking about including, um, I guess, verbiage for descriptions of, of scale um, in addition to the photos. Is that? Um, no, I don't think I was saying that. I mean, I like the photos that, that, that explain what Not they are. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then, um, Will, you were talking about um, the types of property. So um, the X amount of forest land is significantly different than X amount of wetlands. Yeah. That to be considered. Okay, um, and then strength and emphasis on possible impact on neighbors. Yeah. Something we still wanna include, okay. Um, slope, the grade of, is that? Mm. Oh, um, yeah, for exposed soil areas or something. Yeah. Um, Okay, remove wood waste from the list of definitions. Yeah. That's all I have. Um, anything we missed from the committee members? Any, anything we've missed? Nelson Nicholson? Yeah, this isn't so much something that we, we have missed, but it, it's a, a question regarding um, uh, the applicability of, of, of the bylaw once it's put in place. Do we have any sense of how often this might be used? Are we talking about an expectation of, of it being required half a dozen times a year or 200 times a year? Any idea? To some extent, I think it depends on the scale. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of like the largest ones, it's probably a handful in terms of like large subdivisions and then things like, you know, community center and fire hall, which are on scales that like we don't normally see, you know, sort of typical development. Um, but but in counting all the small ones, it could be, yeah, could it be a hundred in a year? I don't think that's unreasonable. Okay. I'm just thinking how often we're being asked as council to think about um, the staff time required to do certain things. And this is an important bylaw, but there's a, a, a cost benefit at the lower end that um, I think we need to mm -hmm. consider pretty carefully. Did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 that does bring also the, 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 uh, the point of the cumulative effect in a neighborhood or something like that of, of, of small alterations. Um, I don't think we, it's, it's easy at this point to, uh, to, to, to bring that in, but um, I think if we ever get the, the uh, um, inventory of natural asset assets uh, uh, done for, for, for the island, that would be something that might be added in the future is, is consideration of, of cumulative effects in, in, a, in different uh, parts of the island. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've seen how difficult that's been for the province to get its head around in the last decade. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, I just I, I thought it needed to be needed to be brought up. I know it's something that I think came up in the council discussion, 
in terms of thinking about should the limits have be tied to lot size to some extent, thinking that like, you know, where I live, they're all quarter acre lots. And so if every property can do, you know, 20 cubic meters or 50 square meters of soil, well, it adds up, but it, it, you know, it's a relatively large part of, of the lot versus if you're on a 10 acre site and you can do 50 square meters of soil, well, that's a lot less impact. Um, so should it, should, should those limits have some, some percentage tied to them too, where it's like, you can do this or up to this much of your lot. Um, and that kind of gets into, you worried about the absolute scale of the, you know, the site alteration or about the, um, like relative scale of the site alteration. And the nature of it. Yeah. It's a tough one. Yeah. All right. Discussion through. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, great presentation and, and uh, thanks for answering all our questions. Of course, thanks for having me. Hold on a second. Oh, you need to vote. Oh, Steph wants a vote. <laughs> Oh, um, Steph, you're always you're always <laughs> bringing my nose into the wind. Thank you. Hey, listen, if you guys don't vote, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, we've, we've okay, got... then I, added, I added the last bullet to include consideration of lot size relative to amount of soil. Do you want that included? I that that I'm a little uneasy because I think of the cumulative effects okay. of you've got. A, a, a development that's all a whole bunch of, of uh, small acre lots, you know, small sized lots. If everybody's nice. um, doing 10, 20 percent of their their lot, that that's the equivalent of of twenty percent of a big lot. So, yeah, I, I agree with Will. Um, I, I I don't see I don't see that as that important. Okay. So the previous, um, the list that we looked at with um, wordsmithing offline. Yep. Can you there? pop that up one, one last sure. time there, Steph? Right. So, Motion to approve. I, I'm, uh, I'm, when the, um, when you're sharing the screen, I can't see all my, uh, my squares, Steph. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, Maureen's making a motion. She's moving yeah. it. And does anyone want to? I'll start? second that. Okay. So and then, all in favor? And everybody's hands up. Great. Yeah. Unanimous. Thank now you. I can say thank you, Daniel, and, 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 uh, <laughs> and you can now uh, get on with your day. Thank you. All right. So we're into updates. And we're starting with Bonnie, who's going to do 5.1 and uh, uh, 6.1 together. Great, thanks. I'm just going to start with a little presentation that was actually going to be 6.1, and then I'll go into just a, a few of the, the other initiatives that staff's working on currently. I just wanted to... And that's okay for everybody there. Yep. I, just, I just wanted to um, bring forward uh, this initiative for the benefit of awareness for the committee, um, just because I think some of you are aware that this is going on. It's a staff led initiative, um, but maybe some others aren't. And I think it's pretty exciting. So it's just a few slides that uh, put together. And um, what it is, is it's um, a Marine Stewardship Partners uh, for Bowen Island, Nekle um, It's a group of community members that has been assembled. And I'll just sort of give you a little bit of background on how it came about and um, what we're up to. So basically the impetus for this uh, partnership 
was um, the work that the David Suzuki Foundation and OceanWise um, did. They did some great work in around 2017, 2018. And what uh, David Suzuki Foundation did primarily was they analyzed different areas of high ecological value or put ecological value on certain areas throughout House Sound. And they also identified um, areas with significant human activity um, and identified conservation opportunities and needs for these particular areas. So this map shows the different conservation areas. There were 34 priority conservation areas within House Sound that were identified and seven occur within Bowen Island municipality jurisdictional boundaries. Um, some of some of the uh, areas are Mannion Bay, um, Tunstall Bay, Cape Roger Curtis, Dorman Point, and others. And you know these are these are areas for our community, uh, you know, special places for our community as well. Um, in in the map, the green areas, the green or yellow kind of shade shaded areas, are um, areas that promote management and stewardship, and the blue areas are to promote marine protection. So the green areas are those that maybe have a little bit more of human um, influence. The, there's lots of different criteria, but I think the important um, point is that um, this work has been done and they've identified these areas as special, special places. So what happened was that um, the PCAs uh, served as an inspiration for the creation of the Marine Stewardship Partners. And the intention was to advance community understanding and conservation of these areas. And kind of a, a tagline that I really like that Bob Turner speaks of quite frequently is by the community, for the community, and led by the community are keys to stewardship. So the members that are part of this group uh, are listed here. We have uh, Bowen Island Municipality. So Liam Edwards, sits, our CAO, sits on the committee as does Carla and myself. And it really is a staff-led initiative with um, you know, participation and collaboration with all these other groups, um, representatives from these groups. Um, it's really important to have you know, our CAO endorsing staff time to be used in this capacity. So um, we also have members from the Bowen Island Conservancy. We have Sea Change Marine Conservation Society represented, David Suzuki Foundation, Bowen Island Fish and Wildlife Club, and also the Akatsum House Sound Marine Stewardship Initiative. We decided <clears throat> to, oh, and also I just wanted to mention that the really the, the person who dreamt up the partnership in the beginning was Bob Turner and contacted me and just sort of, you know, just was really gung-ho of trying to bring these priority conservation areas to life and not let them just sit in some GIS map somewhere. Um, so despite the, um, you know, all of the different areas, we decided as a group to focus prim uh, initially on Manion Bay or uh, Clackwam, um, as we like to call it now, because there's been so much discrepancy, you know, Hotel Bay, Deep Bay, Manion Bay. So if we just go back to uh, Clackwam, uh, Clam Bay, I think that that's setting us in a, on a good trajectory. So the reason why we focused on Manion Bay uh, initially is just that council has really endorsed the restoration of the bay over the last decade. Uh, different councils, you know, the initiative is, has uh, passed along from council to council and, and I think great things have happened there and there's still more room for opportunity to enhance uh, the ecological assets that are in the bay. So the vision uh, for the group is um, that the unique marine ecology of our local priority conservation area in Hakatsama House Sound is preserved and enhanced, which should be various, sorry, plural. And the purpose of the group is to, I'm just going to turn over my sheet here. Uh, the purpose of the group is to achieve through collaboration, sharing of resources and engaging the community, um, we aim to improve stewardship and conservation of our marine environment. 
And one example so far, um, we have been able to, as a group, provide feedback to the Conservancy as they um, take uh, some of the content that was included in the amazing marine atlas that the Conservancy put together and um, expanding upon um, some of that content and developing an uh, educational website. And Will will talk a little bit about that um, coming up very shortly. So the vision, statement, purpose, goals. So the goals are to engage and educate the community, engage and educate the voting community, develop marine policy, and communicate um, our findings and our initiatives to the community. So with that, um, I think looking forward, really, this is our, you know, looking forward, what we, we hope and is that, you know, we have conservation, conser conservation projects on the go all the time. And the group is always open to discuss and act upon new ideas. And ideally, the partnership model is replicated in other communities throughout House Sound and beyond. I'm going to be presenting um, this slideshow uh, or variation of it at the Ocean Watch Action Task Force group um, when we meet in June and maybe, you know, taking it to the community forum as well at some point. And in the future, local partnership groups could ideally come together and share action stories about PCAs in and around their communities and the the great work that's going on to enhance and preserve and protect and conserve the ecological attributes of those PCAs. So that was just a little um, uh, overview of the group. And I think we're pretty excited about it. As I say, it's a staff led initiative and um, I think it's exciting work. And so we'll see more to, more to come. Great, thanks Bonnie. Yeah. So I just uh, I could just move in just uh, just a few. I know we're we're for time here. We want to keep going, but I just want to give a little bit of update about what Carla and I have been working on at the staff level. Um, so uh, Carla and Brad, our parks foreman. Um, paddled out to Oyster Island and put some, or sorry, Onion Island and put Oyster Catcher signage on the island. And also there's Sealy Park signage and Tunstall Bay signage. So that, that was great. Thanks so much, Carla and Brad. That was good. Earth Day was a success. We um, had some red cedar saplings that we gave away to community members. We felt that red cedar was very significant in that it is uh, some of our trees have died on the island um, over the last few years and just because of the First Nation significance of that tree. So yeah, so we had we had 50 saplings and they all were picked up <laughs> by the community. So that was really good. So some cedar, little cedar trees have been planted. Um, we're starting work on our invasive species, you know, our mapping that's ongoing. Uh, we try to map our nasty, most nasty invasive species um, in our GIS system, keep tabs on that. Yes, McKaylee? I just heard um, yesterday that there's a new population of the Japanese knotweed at Tunstall Bay Community Association. And I haven't gone to, to check it, but it's been on my mind to let you know. I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for, well, it's awesome that it's not awesome, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's good to know. So yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and we've also the new, like it's sort of like the early detection rapid response, just like for wildfire. It's sort of the same philosophy that we use for invasive species. And um, one of one of which, um, which has been identified as the Japanese butter burr uh, recently. It's a magnificent, um, it's, yeah, it's a magnificent plant. Um, however, it is uh, a scary one because it can survive and outcompete native vegetation in riparian areas. It does well in shade. So those are the sort of um, ones that plants that can have ecological implications that are quite uh, deleterious. 
Um, and then Mount Gardner, I think, you know, we've done some publications. I know um, maybe Will and some others um, here today uh, took part in preliminary discussions with the province. Um, more will be revealed. Uh, Representative Brian Mitchell from the province is coming at the beginning of June um, to engage the community further. And um, so I think we're moving forward anyway, where that goes. Um, the sustainable grants, I just wanted to let everybody know, even though we publicized quite you know, extensively, we didn't receive any applications this year for um, projects. So what I propose to the group is that Carla and I, and with discussions with other staff here, um, will come back to the committee next month with um, some potential suggestions, um, see how the committee feels about those suggestions. Sounds good. Um, and I think, I think that's that's it for now. Slots on the go. Okay, thanks, Bonnie. Okay, next on the agenda here. Councillor Nicholson has. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Sorry. Yeah, just to just to add, um, the CARA funding, if everybody remembers, was uh, essentially the program was cancelled. Uh, last year, but it has been resurrected. And uh, there was just a, a, an announcement from the province that our CAO shared with us. The, the program is coming back. There's some information on, on, the, on the new version uh, online, more to follow. But the bottom line impact is that it will go from 11 million uh, funding for the entire province to over 70 million for, for a CARIC project. So it's a significant additional uh, chunk of change that is yep. going to be coming back to, to communities. And when we've got more information, we'll, we'll share. Great, that's, that's great news. Thank you, Marie. Okay, so we're going on to uh, committees and council, uh, Councillor Hawking and uh, Councillor Nicholson. Um, I'll, the only thing that I was thinking is when we mentioned at the beginning of the meeting that um, we were doing the site alteration bylaw, but not the hazardous slopes, it was not because we didn't um, think that hazardous slopes was important. It's just that we were looking at staff time, which Maureen talked about a little bit in, in the discussion, is that there was really only time before the, uh, you know, we've just got a tiny little bit of time before the, the summer, and then the election will be right after that. So it's... Um, it was what we could fit in. So it's not that that wasn't important. It's just that we're trying, we're doing what we could do. Okay, um, thanks, David. Yeah, Maureen, I, I, the CARP thing was important. I'm not sure that we've got anything else. Uh, uh, just a, a, a bit of follow up. Um, we had a recommendation to council at our last meeting regarding uh, water conservation. And uh, Dave wasn't at the council meeting and I hadn't attended the ACAC meeting. So discussion of that, recommend, that committee recommendation was deferred to this coming Tuesday. Yeah. So that, that will come back and it might be uh, you know, informed by, are, are we still having Greg joining us at 12.15? Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. Um, but yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see where some of the, that discussion goes at next council. All right, so I guess it's up, I'm, I'm next up. Uh, uh, it's, uh, the title is Bowen Marine Atlas, but it's actually the uh, um, Gulakam uh, Priority Conservation Area uh, focus that, uh, that I'll be talking about. The, uh, the team of uh, Bob Turner, Len Gilday, and me, and our editor, uh, Susan Monroe, are working on the follow-up to the Marine Atlas, which is a website called Discovering Pulakam. And it's aimed at um, uh, Bowen Islanders, especially people uh, that, that use uh, Deep Bay, Manion Bay, Pulakam. Um, for recreation or, or other uses. And it's uh, intended to inform, inspire and engage them in uh, uh, protection and stewardship of that area. 
And uh, so we have finished the content, which is text and uh, illustrations and photos. And we're uh, just beginning to work with a, a website uh, developer who will be uh, helping us put the, the material together. So hopefully sometime this year, we will have uh, a, a website up and running uh, um, with links from the um, uh, uh, Bowen Island Conservancy website. So that's, that's my report. It's been fun working with those people. And, and uh, uh, I, I've got to say, uh, uh, spending as much time as, as we have with, with that, uh, that body of water, it's, it's, uh, it's a stunning place. So next, um, new business. We've done 6.1. Um, 6.2 is water conservation mechanisms and in new buildings, new builds and retrofits from, who's, who's running this? Who's, who's speaking on this? So Greg Cormier was going to come, but unfortunately he, he, he can't make it. Um, yep. He has some scheduling conflict. He's working with his students today down at the fire hall, yep. Um, yep. which is great, a great All initiative. Right. So we will get him next month. Hopefully he's okay. a busy guy, so. Okay. Other business, anything to add? Information items we've got? Um, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, uh, zooming through the, uh, uh, the work plan uh, on my own. So thank you, Bonnie, for uh, getting that uh, to us. And um, I think we're coming to the end. Next meeting to be determined. Am, am I missing anything, Steph? Mm -hmm. No, I think that's good. But just to clarify then, so for next meeting, we'll get Greg properly. My apologies yep. for my role in the confusion today. Yep. Um, and then for next meeting, we'll have um, Bonnie and Carla uh, care up ideas, correct? Yep. Um, and what, uh, was there another pressing topic that came from this? Oh. We, we also were going to ask... Um, Thrive Bowen to come oh, and yes. speak. Yeah. Yes, Thrive coming. Yeah. They were not, unable to come this meeting, but thank you. Yeah. And Michaeli, was that what you were going to bring up or something else? I was just going to ask about following up on the previous care. Um, if I was specifically interested in the movie that was done, does anybody know if that's been finished? Yeah, so I did have communication with the, the youth that were putting together the film and it's in post-production stage right now. So I'm hoping that we'll, we'll have it out soon this summer. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. so, okay. With, cool. with, with, with that, I guess it's time to adjourn. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, and see you when uh, when Steph brings us together again. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thanks.